Feeding competition horses isn't just a matter of guesswork. It's both an art and a science. Correct feeding appropriate to the level of the work the horse is to undertake is one factor which can help ensure that you get the best from your horse. But it isn't just competition horses who need a balanced healthy diet. All horses do. And knowing where to start when it comes to feeding is a problem every horse owner has to face. No matter what kind of horse or pony you have, it has precise needs which have to be met in order for you to enjoy a happy and healthy partnership. A few thousand years ago, ponies which grazed the vast expanse of land available to them would have survived like today's native ponies without supplementary feeding. There is no doubt that today grassland still remains the most natural feed for all horses and ponies. The horse's digestive system evolved for a free-roaming kind of life. The stomach is small and designed for little and often feeding. But since horses have been domesticated, much has changed. These days, everywhere we look, development is taking place to meet the needs of our ever-growing population. Grassland is at a premium, so there is little of the horse's natural environment left. Traditional meadows, once a common sight with their wide variety of herbage and grasses, are few and far between. The introduction of more refined breeds with higher nutritional needs, coupled with the decline of grassland, means there is a greater need for supplementary feeding for all types of horses and ponies. Although man has harnessed the power of the horse for over 5,000 years, nowadays an increasing number of people devote their leisure time to riding. The latest estimates indicate that there are approximately half a million horses and ponies. Many of these will have limited grazing, some none at all. Now the horse is not free to roam and relies almost entirely on man for his nutritional needs. It's not surprising that supplementing the natural diet of grass has become a vital part of caring for your horse. Every horse and pony is an individual with different requirements and it is our responsibility to ensure these are met. In the distant past, the horse was in control of what he ate. Now he is domesticated, we have to decide what he is given. We can see just how horses differ. Horses not in work will generally be best maintained on a high forage, low compound diet. This is particularly true of the native type ponies who convert nutrients very easily into fat. Horses in hard work will require a significantly increased level of compound feed in order to meet their energy needs. Forages do not generally contain sufficient energy to sustain high levels of activity. It is up to us to make the decisions on the correct feed for our horses. And this is where the art of feeding truly comes into its own. When working out a feeding regime, there are some important points to consider. These are the 10 golden rules of feeding. You will find most of these rules in any horse management book you may care to look at. They are certainly traditional and there are sound reasons for them. When feeding, we are looking for optimum conversion of nutrients. So it is an aim that horses should be able to make the best use of the feed that we give them. The first and most important rule is always allow the horse access to a supply of fresh, clean water. The horse is made up of about 60% water and it is essential for all bodily functions. Keep water containers clean, check field supplies to ensure that water is not contaminated and, in the case of streams, that they are still running in dry weather. Feed little and often is another well-known rule. As we have mentioned, the stomach is small and best suited to small amounts being given regularly. Aim to give no more than about two and a half kilos or five pounds maximum in one feed. Ideally, horses should not go for more than eight hours without access to food. Always weigh your feeds. 
This does not mean you have to weigh it every day, but that you should know how much of each feed your scoop holds, as some are significantly heavier than others. Be careful not to overfeed, as this is not only wasteful, but also very expensive. Always use good quality feed. On no account use feed which is obviously mouldy, as mould can lead to respiratory problems and colic. Furthermore, poor quality feed has a low nutritional value. Feed according to the horse's body weight. This will reduce the risk of overfeeding, which can lead not only to overweight horses, but serious conditions such as laminitis. Always make changes to the diet gradually. Allow 7 to 10 days when making significant changes to the diet. This includes bringing a horse in from grass for the winter or turning a horse out during spring. This allows the microbes in the hind gut to establish and become accustomed to the new type of feed. Feed your horse according to the work he is doing, not the amount of work you expect him to do. Horses should be fit enough to undertake the work expected of them and giving them extra high energy feed, perhaps the day before a competition, will not make them any more likely to win. Delay exercise after feeding. Like us, the horse's lungs function better when he has not got a full stomach. If the horse is going to be working hard, about three hours should be allowed between feeding and exercise. But for light hacking and slow work, an hour is generally advised. Feed plenty of forage. You have already seen that grass is the most natural feed for horses and hay or other forages substitute fresh grass in the winter. It helps to keep horses occupied during the long hours in the stable and the fibre contained in the forage is important to keep the gut content open and moving. Fibre holds water in the hind gut and can help prevent dehydration in horses involved in prolonged exercise, for example endurance riding. The horse is a creature of habit, so routine is important. He'll be waiting in the morning even if you want to lie in, so try to ensure you feed at the same times each day. While you are the best person to decide how your horse or pony should be fed, there are many factors which will determine how individual horses and ponies diets should be made up. One of the main considerations is the breed and size of the horse. Sam here looks as if he is twice as big as Beauty, so you might think he would eat twice as much food. But as a general rule, energy requirements decrease slightly with body weight. So, per 100 kilos of body weight, large horses need less food for maintenance than ponies. As we said earlier, native ponies need less food to keep condition than thoroughbreds. That's not just to do with the level of work that's required of them, they are just good doers. They have evolved to make the best of summer grazing and build up fat stores so that when supplies are limited in winter, they have reserves to see them through to spring. Next, we need to consider the rider's ability when determining feed requirement. A novice rider may, first and foremost, need a very calm mount, whereas a more experienced rider might be placing more demands on the horse. Of course, the level of work you expect from your horse determines the energy he will need from his food. For prolonged, slow work, a low energy feed may be best, whereas for faster, short bursts, the horse will need a high energy, cereal based feed. The age of the horse can significantly affect the diet it should receive. The feeding of young horses is worthy of a video of its own and is beyond scope here. However, young growing horses will need plenty of high quality protein in order to develop into healthy animals with a strong skeleton. The energy requirements of mature horses in work will increase manyfold according to the work being done, but the protein requirements will remain relatively low. Approximately 10% of the horses in Britain today are over 15 years old. For most of these horses, a special diet will not be necessary. 
However, requirements can change with advancing years, so if older horses have difficulty holding condition, they should be given a diet of higher feed value. Protein can play an important part, so a proportion given as stud cubes or breeding mix is ideal. Where they have difficulty eating hay, a high fibre cube may be soaked and used as a total or partial hay replacer. It's also important to assess the horse's condition. You may need to adjust the feeds if your horse is under or overweight. Energy in horse feed is measured in calories and those not burnt up in work lead to an increase in condition. And finally, consider your horse's temperament. There is no point feeding high energy feeds to a fizzy horse as it may make it worse. Different animals can respond differently to cereal feeds and although this may be a matter of trial and error, it's worth getting it right. It's difficult to understand just how the horse digests its food without having a look at what goes on inside. Tim Phillips, a leading vet at the country's premier veterinary centre, the Animal Health Trust, shows us exactly what happens during digestion. Horses are herbivores. This means that their digestive systems are adapted to utilise a diet consisting entirely of plants for all their nutrient requirements. In particular, this necessitates the ability to digest cellulose, a type of carbohydrate which is the fundamental building block of plant material. Different herbivores, such as the cow, the rabbit or the horse, have evolved different means of fermenting this cellulose. The horse is known as a hind gut fermenter because it is the hind gut, that is the part that follows the stomach and the small intestine, in which the fermentation process takes place. We will talk more of this a little later, but we mustn't forget that the process of digesting food involves the whole of the alimentary tract, from the mouth to the colon, and a healthy fit horse needs all parts to be in full working order. Food is taken into the mouth by the actions of the very strong muscular lips and the incisor teeth, which clamp onto grass or hay in a hay net. The food is then torn off by movements of the horse's head. Once in the mouth, chewing or mastication occurs. The actions of the tongue and the jaws churn the food round so that it gets ground between the surfaces of the cheek teeth, or molars. The jaws of carnivores, say dogs, only move up and down. But herbivores can move their jaws from side to side too, so enabling this grinding action. The grinding is important since it breaks up food particles, making it easier for the enzymes further down the system to digest the food efficiently. As you can see here, each cheek tooth is set so close to the next that there is a continuous surface from tooth to tooth, both on the lower jaw and the opposing upper jaw. However, the lower jaw is slightly narrower than the upper jaw, and this means that the outer edges of the upper teeth and the inner edges of the lower teeth tend not to get worn down so much as the middle surface of the teeth. This can result in sharp edges, which ultimately may cause painful gums and inhibit mastication. In bad cases, this upsets the whole digestive process, such that poor body condition is one of the prime symptoms of dental disease. Chewing also stimulates the secretion of saliva, which is important because it helps to hydrate dry food and starts the process of adding digestive secretions to break down the food substances into simpler molecules for absorption in the intestines. Every so often, the horse swallows, propelling a bolus of food into the esophagus, an elastic-like tube which carries the food from the throat to the stomach by a mechanism known as peristalsis. We'll now look at the stomach and intestines of a horse to see exactly what they look like. The horse's stomach, which you can see here, is relatively small and simple, more suited to the intake of small quantities of food frequently than large quantities infrequently. 
the one-way valve between the esophagus and the stomach is very strong to the extent that if the stomach becomes overfilled for some reason, it will often rupture before vomiting occurs. In the first part of the stomach, a certain type of bacteria called lactobacilli starts the fermentation process, but this is limited by the acid environment. Too rapid an intake of concentrate food delays the mixing with these acid secretions and can cause too much fermentation in the stomach, leading to a painful overproduction of gas and possibly inflammation of the stomach lining. Food normally doesn't stay long in the stomach, soon passing into the small intestine. This is a hose-like structure, which is so long in the horse, about 25 meters or 75 feet, that it sits in the abdomen as a convoluted coil. Here, the serious digestion starts. An average horse adds about 100 liters, that's about 20 gallons of fluid, every day into the small intestine via glandular secretions, bile from the liver, and pancreatic juices. This fluid contains a myriad of different chemicals which neutralize acid and degrade the proteins, fats, starch, and sugars, enabling them to be absorbed through the intestinal wall, along with some electrolytes and vitamins. For a commonly fed diet of, say, hay and oats, about two-thirds of the completely digestible parts of the feed will have been broken down and absorbed by the time the food reaches the end of the small intestine, a journey that can take from just 45 minutes up to three or four hours normally. The last segment of the small intestine is called the ileum, and this marks the junction between the small intestines and the cecum through the ileocecal valve. The cecum is the first part of the large intestine, which is the specialized fermenting unit of the horse's gut. The difference between it and the small intestine is that here, the digestion of residual carbohydrates and proteins that have not been dealt with by the small intestine depends upon the activity of a multitude of living organisms, such as bacteria and protozoa, collectively known as microbes. These are able to break down the less soluble carbohydrates, such as cellulose, into volatile fatty acids, and these acids are then used as a vital energy source for the horse. About once every two to three minutes, the cecum undergoes a coordinated expulsive wave to empty its contents into the large colon. This is the noisiest part of gut movement and can often be heard just by standing next to the horse. The large colon is a huge structure, about four meters long and up to 130 liters in capacity. In fact, it is so big that in order to fit into the abdomen, it has to become folded on itself to form a number of hairpin turns called flexures. One of these, the pelvic flexure, is a common site for impaction or blockage of food material. As well as fermenting the more fibrous parts of the diet, the large intestine is critical in recovering the massive amount of water that is secreted into the gut in the process of digestion. Failure of this function can quickly lead to dehydration. So all in all, you can see that the health of your horse's population of microbes in its hind gut is integral to the health of the whole horse. This has a number of implications in feeding management. For instance, the proportion of different types of microbe adapt to the constituents of a particular diet. That is why any changes in diet, especially increases in concentrate, should be introduced gradually over several days. Otherwise, indigestion, shown by colic or perhaps diarrhea, may occur. Furthermore, roughage or forage should never fall below about one third of the total weight of the daily food intake, even in high-performing horses. 
Sudden overloads in soluble carbohydrates like starch that are found in concentrate feeds or in lush grass may overload the small intestine, leading to an abnormal quantity reaching the large intestine. This can result in the overproduction of lactic acid, causing inflammation of the gut lining, which then loses its protection against bacterial toxins, allowing them to enter the system. Perhaps the best known consequence of this is laminitis. The common horse parasites, roundworms or tapeworms, invade the gut wall, usually around the small intestine and large intestinal junction. This leads to disruption of the normal digestion absorption processes, and again to a number of possible effects, usually malnutrition. Finally, the horse's dependence on its large intestinal microbial inhabitants is one reason why prescribing antibiotics to a horse is not as straightforward as it is, say, to dogs or even humans. Most antibiotics will wipe out these helpful organisms, as well as the ones causing the infection being treated, so causing unacceptable digestive disturbances. Transit time in the large intestine takes a day or more, but eventually the ingester reaches the small colon. Here, feces are formed by further water resorption, leaving only the indigestible fiber material to be expelled as droppings through the rectum and anus. So let's go back now and open up the stomach to see what the food looks like once it has passed down the esophagus. As you can see, it looks very much like the food which was originally fed, because it has not yet been digested. Moving on now to the small intestine, it looks quite different. The bile and pancreatic juices have been at work, and the food has been broken down ready for absorption, so it's quite liquid. Now if we move to the large intestine, the water has started to be absorbed. And you can see that the material is becoming drier and starting to resemble the faeces that we see expelled by the horse. Finally, in the small colon, this is where the feces are formed. And that represents the final stage in the digestion process. So you can see, the gut is a very complicated organ which hasn't changed significantly since horses ran wild on the plains. Now we keep them in a domestic environment and give them compound feeds, so it's vital that the necessary nutrients are built into their daily diet. We have seen how the horse digests its feed, but what are the vital nutrients essential for life? Ruth Bishop, nutritionist for Spiller's Horse Feeds, explains what they are and what they do. Contrary to popular belief, given a free choice of foods, the horse doesn't naturally select what is best for it. Like us, it will select the tastiest ingredients, but these don't necessarily add up to a balanced diet. The first essential nutrient is water, as we've seen. The next most important nutrient is not protein, as you might think, but energy. Horses must be fed to meet their energy requirements before all others. Energy, which may also be thought of as calories, is needed for maintaining body heat, retaining condition, growth, lactation and work. In fact, requirements for protein and certain minerals are related to the energy level, so it is important to get energy right first. 
The form of energy we talk about for horses is digestible energy, or DE. All feeds, with the exception of mineral and vitamin supplements, are sources of energy. Just how much depends on a particular feed. The energy in each ingredient is derived from the carbohydrate and fat content. Compound feeds offer a combination of both these energy sources. There are two main types of carbohydrates structural carbohydrates and non-structural carbohydrates. Structural carbohydrates are often referred to as fibre and are found in plant cell walls and include cellulose, hemicellulose, pectin and the indigestible lignin. Fibre is often overlooked as a source of energy but it will contribute all or most of the energy in the total diet of many horses. Non-structural carbohydrates on the other hand are starches and sugars and are found in cereals, peas, beans, molasses and the like. Energy can also be provided by oil. Oil provides two and a half to three times as much energy per kilo as cereals. Extra oil can be added to the diet in the form of soya or vegetable oil to increase the energy content. It also has the added bonus of keeping a good shine on the coat. The use of oil in horses' diets is the subject of extensive research and although it has not been shown to benefit horses in every discipline, it seems to be very beneficial in endurance and long, low-intensity work. The third critical nutrient is protein, and this is made up of 23 amino acids used primarily for growth, development and tissue repair and replacement. Protein quality is important and is determined by amino acid makeup. The two most important amino acids are lysine and methionine. These are essential, as without them, the horse cannot fully utilise the rest of the protein in the diet. Many traditionally used cereals are a poor source of essential amino acids. Horses in heavy work require slightly more protein, but this need is generally met by the higher levels of concentrates given as increased work is undertaken. Excess protein is not utilised by horses, but is broken down in the liver and excreted as ammonia. Crude protein levels in compounds vary according to the purpose for which the feed is intended. Levels are higher than the total requirement to make up for the often low content in conserved forage. Minerals are divided into two groups. Those required in relatively large quantities, measured in grams per day, are the major minerals, and those required in smaller amounts measured in milligrams per day, are called trace elements. The major minerals are calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, sodium and potassium. Of these, calcium and phosphorus are always considered together, as their ratio to each other is of paramount importance. Both are essential for bone formation and to maintain skeletal strength. One and a half to two parts calcium to one part phosphorus should be provided in the diet. Diets based on summer grass should achieve this ratio without a problem, but in diets based on minimal forage, cereals and bran for example, the ratio can be inverted, leading to calcium leaching from the bone and the possibility of muscular problems or tying up. Magnesium and potassium levels are rarely deficient in horse diets, particularly if sufficient forage is fed. Potassium is also present in molasses. Sodium and potassium are both mineral salts, termed electrolytes, and as such are lost in sweat. Sodium levels can be low in some feedstuffs, particularly in haze, but giving one to two ounces of salt per day can help to ensure needs are met. The main trace elements for horses are copper, zinc, manganese, iron, cobalt, iodine and selenium. Others are required in such minute quantities or are commonly available in feedstuffs the deficiencies are unlikely. Trace elements fulfil important roles. For instance, copper is involved in the carriage of oxygen in the blood, as well as in bone development, as are zinc and manganese. Whilst iron is rarely deficient in horse diets, horses may suffer from anemia as a result of worm damage. Selenium is involved in maintaining tissue health and it may also be involved in disease resistance. Vitamins are also essential for maintaining good health and light trace elements are required by the horse in small quantities. Vitamins are classified into two groups, those
those soluble in fat and those soluble in water. Fat-soluble vitamins are vitamins A, D, E and K, and these can be stored in the liver. In nature, liver stores are increased during the summer from grazing, and the stores are used in the winter. Obviously, horses stabled all year round will receive less of these vitamins from natural sources and will therefore benefit from the supplement they receive from compound feed. The water-soluble vitamins comprise the B-group vitamins and vitamin C. Horses cannot store these vitamins, although they can make vitamin C themselves, and B vitamins are synthesised by microbes within the hind gut. So, we have looked at the requirements for life and work. Now let's look at how these are supplied from feed. We have seen how science relates to feeding. Now we are going to have a look at the practical aspects of feeding and choosing suitable feeds to meet the animal's requirement. Anne Marshall is product manager for Spiller's Horse Feeds, so has plenty of experience in these matters. Even though the horse's primary food is grass, as we've seen, there are still times when he won't receive enough nutrients just by grazing. So now we'll look at some cereals and raw ingredients and see what extra nutrition they provide. First we'll look at oats, the most traditional feed for horses. Oats are easily digested as the husk is soft and they're high in fibre. They may be fed whole, but are more usually bruised or rolled. Once rolled, they should be used fresh, as vitamins are lost when the husk is broken. Oats, like most straits, can vary significantly between samples. For instance, they may contain between 6 and 13% protein, and 11 to 13 megajoules of energy, depending mainly on the conditions in which they were grown and stored. It should also be noted that all oats are a poor source of quality protein, as they have a low lysine content. In common with other cereals, the calcium to phosphorus ratio is reversed. Therefore, they should be fed with a calcium supplement, or better still, a specific oat balancer. Now we'll take a look at barley. Unlike oats, barley should not be fed whole, as it has a hard husk which needs to be broken to make the grain digestible. It may be fed rolled, but is more commonly cooked in some way to make it more digestible. Steam cooking or micronising are both equally effective treatments, or it can be extruded or even boiled in the good old-fashioned way. It may be worth mentioning here that oats are thought to be more heating than barley. Barley, in fact, is higher in energy. However, a significant fact to bear in mind for those who may feed by the scoop and not by weight is this. You can easily feed up to a quarter more energy in a scoop of lightly rolled oats than in a similar scoop of cooked flake barley. The oats weigh one kilo, while the cooked flake barley weighs only 750 grams. Another cereal to mention is maize. Maize is not grown as a cereal crop in the UK. You may see it being grown, but that's made into silage for cattle. Maize grain is, by anyone's standard, a high energy feed. It has approximately 16 megajoules of energy and contains about 70% starch. For this reason, it should always be fed with care. It's relatively low in total protein, about 8 to 10%, the quality of which is poor. Wheat is never used as the whole cereal in horse feeds, as it is hard to digest in large quantities. It may be used as part of the ration when cooked and flaked, or as a component of compound feed. However, a byproduct of wheat milling, bran, is commonly used. Bran is the outer husk of wheat. It's thought of as a high fibre filler, but its energy level is only slightly lower than that of oats, and approximately 15% crude protein, though this is of low quality. In addition, the calcium to phosphorus ratio is totally the wrong way round. 10 phosphorus to 1 calcium. And the practice of mashing horses once a week is falling out of favour, as this is seen as being on a par with a rapid change in diet, something to be avoided if possible. Sugar beet pulp is another byproduct, this time of the sugar refining industry. It's high in digestible fibre and has a reasonable energy level, but is only safe to feed once it's been soaked. 
and then it contains about 80% water in total. It's available as shreds or pellets and should be well covered with water and soaked for 8 to 12 hours before use. In summer, it should not be soaked for longer than this as it will ferment easily in warm weather. Now we'll look briefly at some other ingredients which may also be used. This is soy meal, which is the residue left after oil extraction, and this is the best source of vegetable protein. It contains 44% protein with a high lysine content. It's widely used in stud and young stock diets. Traditionally, linseed has been used as a protein feed, though the quality of protein is not especially good. Linseed is the seeds of the flax plant and in their raw state are poisonous, but boiling makes them safe and produces a jelly. After oil extraction, a cake like this is produced, which may also be used. It may be worth mentioning animal protein here, as on occasions people ask about its use in horse feeds. Spillers never use animal protein in their horse feeds. So these are most of the available straight feeds which may be used as they are, but they're also used in a variety of combinations in compound feed, which we'll have a look at a little later. First though, as forage makes up the bulk of any horse's diet, we need to have a look at what's available to us. Ruth. Thank you, Anne. When we talk about forage, we mean bulk feeds such as grass and hay, and there are quite a large range of products to choose from. Hay is the most popular forage for horses. Commonly there are two distinct types, seed hay and meadow hay. Seed hay is coarse and stemmy and is sometimes described as hard hay. It is grown from fields specifically sown with seed mixes of ryegrass and or timothy. This sample is of ryegrass. Meadow hay is softer and contains more leaf. It is comprised of a wider range of grasses harvested from permanent pasture and is generally of higher nutritive value than seed hay and it is often preferred by horses. A common problem with hay is that it can contain mould spores and dust particles which can cause respiratory problems. Hay which is evidently dusty, such as this lovely stuff, should not be used. To be on the safe side, you can soak hay for an hour or so. This will stick the dust particles to the hay, preventing them being inhaled. It is not necessary to soak hay for much longer than an hour as nutrients are lost and the water becomes polluted. A good and popular alternative to hay is haylage. This is grass which has been cut like hay but is only dried for about 24 hours. It is known generally as semi-wilted forage and contains about 55 to 65 percent dry matter. It is double wrapped and sealed in polythene where it undergoes limited fermentation. It is particularly suitable for horses with dust related allergies or where owners wish to limit their horse's exposure to dust as any dust particles on the grass are stuck to the stalks preventing their inhalation by the horse. Once opened, bales should be used within four days as mould can quickly develop once the product is exposed to the air. Silage, which is similar to haylage and made in clamps or big round bales, usually has a higher moisture content and is often of higher feed value. Unlike much commercially produced haylage, it may not be subject to the same strict quality control during manufacture. Oat straw is a good alternative when hay is expensive or in short supply. Barley straw can also be used and both can have similar feed value to late cut seed hay. Any shortfall in feed value can be made up by an appropriate supplement or compound feed. If you want to add more fibre to your horse's hard feed, you can use any one of the chaffs that are available. If you rely on grazing as the sole forage for your horses, especially during the summer, it is important to keep the pasture clean and well maintained. This means topping the grass to keep it no more than three to four inches high and picking up the droppings regularly to reduce the risk of worm infestation and to keep the grass sweet. Remember though, not all horses have plenty of grazing and those that can't get out in the field on a regular basis should be fed something succulent in each feed. 
Sliced carrots and apples are always very popular. So we've looked at the straight ingredients and forage, but what we need to do now is look at some individual horses and the various compound feeds that are available to us and work out the best diets for the different types. So here we have a selection of horses and ponies, some of whom you've seen earlier in the programme, ranging from Polly here, who's an eventer and really has to perform, down to Beauty here, who's a child's pony and obviously has quite different expectations. First, here's Beauty. He's a pedigree Dartmoor, 12-2 pony for teaching children to learn to ride. And obviously he has to remain calm for doing that. This pony's Jigger. He's a 14-2 thoroughbred type of pony. He's highly strung and also prone to laminitis. But he could do with a little bit of weight on him. This is Del Boy, and not only is he unfit, he's also a pretty fat pony, and you can actually see some fairly hefty fat deposits on him. Being overweight is obviously not a good thing. It puts a strain on the heart, the lungs, and the joints. This pony's Socks. She's a Welsh pony, used for all pony club activities, and also for showing. And like any Welsh pony, she's a very good converter of forage. And that's how she derives most of her energy. This is Polly. She's a thoroughbred eventer. And unlike the ponies we've just seen, her requirements will not be met from forage alone. In fact, like a lot of performance horses, energy might be the first thing that she'll run out of. Our last horse is Sam. He's really used for, for leisure. He's, he does quite a lot of hacking and the occasional lesson. So his energy requirements are quite low. So we've seen a good cross section of horses and ponies and they will all have quite different feed requirements. So how do we decide what is best? We have the choice between feeding straights like oats, bran and sugar beet for example, or we can go for a compound feed. The advantage with compound feed is that we know exactly what we're giving our horse, from the amount of energy down to the last vitamin and mineral. And the manufacturer guarantees that the nutrient levels are the same in every bag. As we said earlier, this is not the case with straight feeds, where the nutritional value can vary significantly from bag to bag. And unless we scientifically analyse it all, we'll never be totally sure. So using compounds looks like the best answer. Still, there are many types of compound feed on the market, so how do we decide which one of these is best for us? The first decision is whether to use a coarse mixture or a cubed feed. Mixtures are popular, not least because they look very appealing to the human eye. The individual ingredients are easily recognised. Many ingredients used in coarse mixtures are also used in cubes, but they're ground before being passed through a dye to produce pellets or cubes, depending on the diet. For animals needing a low energy diet, an appropriate cube can be a better feed than a coarse mixture, since fibre levels are higher and starch levels lower. Let's now have a look at some of the choice available to us. First, there are compounds suited to high performing horses, such as race horses or horses in seriously hard work. High performance mixtures and race horse cubes are very high in energy to help sustain maximum effort. In addition, they contain higher levels of the vitamins and minerals needed for this level of work. If you compete, you should ensure that your feed is free from prohibited substances. Look on the bag and ensure that the feed has been tested. Only then can you have the security of knowing that your horse will not fail a drug test. For horses which do not need anything approaching high energy levels, the choice is wide from high fibre and horse and pony cubes at the low end of the energy scale to a traditional coarse mixture, which would be classed as medium energy. Many people choose a feed without oats in the hope of controlling fizziness. That is where meadow herb or cool mix come into their own. 
Older horses do not necessarily need a special feed, but as we heard earlier, they may benefit from a higher protein feed, such as breeding mix or stud cubes, if they're not holding condition. And any range of compound feed is completed by stud and young stock diets. Quality protein and optimum vitamins and minerals are the most important elements in these feeds. Once we've decided on the right compound feed, we need to work out exactly how much should be fed daily. In order to do this, the first thing we have to do is find out the weight of our horse. And we can do this in a number of different ways. One pretty accurate way of determining a horse's body weight is to use a weigh tape, like this one here. Weigh tapes do vary a little bit from one to another, but we'll see what this one says. According to this, Polly weighs 520 kilos. And on this tape, it actually tells you how much feed that relates to on a daily basis too, so you don't even have to do the calculation. Thanks, Jay. Another and the most accurate way of weighing horses is with a weigh bridge, such as the one you see here. This is a portable weigh bridge with a digital readout to give you a very accurate indication of any horse or pony's weight. So now let's have a look and see how much Polly weighs. Okay. You can see that Polly weighs 506 kilos on the weigh bridge as against 520 kilos when measured with the weigh tape. So we've seen how to weigh a horse to get an indication of total body weight, but how does that translate into practical feeding? What we need to do now is to take 2 or 2.5% two of the total body weight and give that amount as the total feed to the horse each day. Now that total is divided between concentrates and forage, depending on the level of work the horse is doing. The forage content is either increased or decreased, but the total feed remains the same. And ideally, you should be feeding at least 50% of the total as forage. We now know how to work out the daily feed allowance, but for overweight horses like Del Boy, who we saw earlier, we would only take 2% of his body weight, and most of this could be forage. An example would be a diet made up of a total of 9 kilos of feed. His energy requirements will be around 63 megajoules per day and his protein needs about 605 to 630 grams. This will be supplied from 8 kilos of hay and 1 kilo of horse and pony cubes. As compound feed makes up such a small proportion of Del Boy's diet, he should also be given a vitamin and mineral supplement. For most horses in work, about 2.5% of body weight would be appropriate. This would normally be split between about 70% forage and 30% hard feed. If we take Polly as an example of a horse in very hard work, the ratio of forage to hard feed would probably be reduced. As you can see, her energy requirements are significantly higher than Del Boy's. Bearing in mind the energy and protein supplied by seed hay and competition mix, her diet should be made up of 5 kilos of hay and 7.6 kilos of compound feed. This diet provides 17 grams more protein than recommended, but this amount is so small it's of little dietary significance. However, if the protein content is considerably higher than required, the diet should be reformulated. Polly's mineral and vitamin needs will be met from compound feed, but about two ounces of salt should be added to her daily ration. Remember, when you're feeding any horse, no matter what the breed, size or type, always follow the ten rules of feeding. Of course, all that we've said here can only ever be a guide, you must get to know your horse and decide yourself exactly what is right.